pray that your Holy Spirit would settle our minds and clear them and help us to read your word, to revere it, to wrestle with it, to seek the wisdom that James reminds us that we have such need of and that you are so willing to give. And we do pray that you would bless our time together, that it might be pleasing in your sight, that it might be for the building up of the church, the body of Christ, for it is in his name that we ask this. Amen. So this evening we're um, moving to the, uh, the next kind of category. Um, if, if you remember the little chart, uh, the, the little chiastic outline that, that I put together in one of the early weeks, um, but also again each week I remind you that there's, there's nothing dogmatic about this outline. I do not believe for a moment that James wrote it out before he wrote his letter. Uh, it's really, as I said, it's, it's more to help me organize my thoughts as, as I view James as a much more rabbinic writing than, than the other books of the Bible. And um, having opportunity over the years, not, not cover to cover by any means, but just reading the Mishnah and, and you know, yeah, just the, the rapid fire seeming change of, sometimes I wonder, because the Mishnah is broken up into actual books, and those books are, are, they're supposed to deal with a topic, the Sabbath, for example. And then you read within that chapter, and you're like, what does this have to do with the, you know, I guess they had to put it somewhere. And there are people who think that that's the way James is with what he has to say. Well, you've got to put it somewhere. Uh, you know, almost a stream of consciousness type of writing. But I don't think that's the case, and I do think that what we're dealing with here is much more of a tapestry than it is uh, a letter, that the themes that are there are woven, interwoven in each other, so that you'll be reading about temptation and trial and endurance and in comes the tongue, you know, because that's obviously another major theme or thread in, in this um, book. So the, the point of the chiastic structure is, is simply to provide a, some structure, acknowledging that this is, as, as all commentators do, this is a very difficult book to outline. And in fact, when I've looked at the commentators and I've looked at their outline, none of them agree, and all of them leave me wondering, well, how'd you, how'd you get that? It's like you're forcing it into a, a, a linear type of outline, is what they're trying to do. Okay, progressing to a conclusion, when in fact um, the conclusion is probably at the very beginning. That the perfection of your faith might be manifested through your endurance. Okay, so um, anyhow, looking at then worldliness and true religion, which is kind of the counterpoint to temptations and trials and endurance, because what we're dealing with is the Christian living in the world. The diaspora Jewish believers that he's writing to um, are definitely undergoing a great deal of trials and temptations, having been scattered from their homes. But we're going to find out as we continue to read that many of these trials and temptations are actually within the community itself. That the problems are not necessarily anymore from external persecution, that there's favoritism, there's oppression within the body. And that shouldn't surprise us because we see it in Corinth. It's alluded to in Romans 14, okay? that, that disharmony within the body is, is not uncommon. Paul writes to the Galatians, um, you know, a very... I want to read it and not misquote it, but... You know, things were no more harmonious in the first century than they are many times today. But in Galatians 5, 15, he says, But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. So, um, that's not unlike what we're going to read in James. The struggles that were going on inside the church. 
But James, as we noted before, James focuses more on living the life, or as they say, walking the walk, rather than talking the talk. It's not to say that his theology is in any way wrong. It's just not as obtrusive as Paul's. He's much more uh, focusing on what's called orthopraxy. You're probably familiar with the word orthodoxy, right belief. Orthopraxy is right practice. Of course, you're all familiar with orthodontists, you know, straight teeth. So straight belief is orthodoxy, straight practice is orthopraxy. And I think it's fairly obvious that James's emphasis is on um, how we live out our faith. Uh, not so much the content of it. Um, that is, I think, largely presumed, but then alluded to in some very key passages, especially chapter 2. So, um, we could put it maybe this way. Orthopraxy without abandoning orthodoxy. And that has been a struggle with the church for 2,000 years. The church has, has swung pendulum-like between an emphasis on doctrine to the point where doctrine is what matters and the church clearly loses sight of its purpose and its, um, its living and then there is a reaction and you see the pendulum swing back towards orthopraxy um, problem is both extremes are, are wrong. Um, they're, um, they're an unhealthy uh, imbalance between the two. And I think James, uh, like all the writers of Scripture, uh, are trying to, uh, is trying to bring a proper balance. Somewhat like um, the prophet Malachi. You know, in, in Malachi, we read, we read uh, the prophetic, really, condemnation uh, of the people of Israel after the exile. But within the midst of that, he, he says, um, you know, basically remember Moses. Again, let me, let me read it and not misquote it. The point being that at no time does any, really any prophetic word from the Bible abandon sound doctrine. Um, Verse 4 of chapter 4 in Malachi, almost the, you know, the end, the closing of the old canon. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Oreb for all of Israel. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's not, that's not really been the thrust of Malachi's message. But orthopraxy without orthodoxy or orthodoxy without orthopraxy, they're both wrong. And I wouldn't want to make a judgment as to which one's more wrong. So James is focusing then on orthopraxy, but what I want to point out just briefly in kind of summary, even though he's talking about trials and tribulations, he really does seem to be limiting the scope or the venue of these struggles to two particular locations. The, 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 the location or the uh, the, the venue of trial. Now, we look at the ancient church, and, you know, we've kind of been raised on Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, you know, we think that the Christians were, were persecuted almost unendingly um, by the Romans, when, of course, the Romans didn't really start persecuting the Christians until, well, Nero did, um, and um, uh, Domitian did. But generally speaking, they were just viewed as Jews, and they persecuted them too. Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. So it wasn't really Romans that were persecuting the early Christians as much as it was Jews. But we saw from Acts that there were times and periods where the church was flourishing and had peace on all sides in favor with God and man. Okay, So it wasn't constant. James doesn't seem to be dealing at all with troubles coming from the surrounding world. 
the two places that, that James is locating the problem and that we've dealt with so far is, first of all, within the believer's heart. And I say heart, James doesn't use that, but within. We looked at that in, in um, chapter 1, where he, and we're going to look at it, Lord willing, next week in chapter 4, but in chapter 1, you know, when he says, don't, don't blame God that, that he's doing this to you, he says, um, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Uh, so Flip Wilson was wrong. You know, the devil doesn't, didn't make me do it. Those of you who are old enough to remember who Flip Wilson was. Um, it's, it's already in us. And then the second venue is not the world, although we're in the world, it's within the community, within the church. Okay, Chapter 2, he says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, he goes on to say, if you show favoritism, you've made a distinction among yourselves. You have become judges with evil motives. These are things that are going on, and we're going to see that throughout. He intermingles those that he castigates and even condemns in the same passages with his beloved brethren. So the, the struggles that James is dealing with or helping to prepare his readers to deal with, and that includes us, do not require either of these two things. So these are not required for us to have trials and, tribu and tribulations, for us to have need of endurance and steadfast faith. We do not require persecution. That is not a necessary component of our struggle in this life. Does that make sense? And we talked about this before, that this is not limited to being persecuted for our faith. He doesn't even mention that in the entire letter, that, th that they're being persecuted because of their profession of faith, at least not that I can interpret. And then the other one that's not required is Satan. Now, he, he has mentioned, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But again, that's after he has said, you know, the big problem's inside you, your lusts. And the devil's not inside you. Yeah, I think sometimes the church gives the devil too much credit and, and uh, grants him almost an ob omnipotence and an omnipresence that he most certainly does not have. He's a created being. And his operations are, are strictly limited by God. We see that in, in the book of Job. But there, there is a, a tendency uh, in reading James and you see this in the, some of the commentaries, especially the older ones. There's a tendency to, to read it through the filter of external persecution, okay? which renders the book somewhat uh, impotent in terms of, of lives lived apart from persecution. If we're not being persecuted, then does James have anything to say to us? Well, I'd say he most certainly does, because he's not limiting what he's saying to persecution. And also... There is another tendency, kind of on a, a different um, spectrum within professing Christianity, to, to blame all of a believer's misfortunes on the devil. You know, the devil's, you'll hear people say it, you know, the devil's really after me today. Well, who are you? <laughs> okay. I mean, how does he manage to, to do that if he's, okay, well, okay, well, maybe one of his, min his demons, yeah. But I don't think that's what James is getting at here. Um, now, don't get me wrong, we talk about resisting the devil, that he's not dismissing the devil by any means. It's simply to say that, uh, well, let me put it in uh, another person's words. I think he, he says it very well, um, Alec Mocher, 
Um, he says, Were there no Satan, there would still be wickedness. Were every prospect pleasing, human nature would still be vile. The enemy is not only within the camp, within the heart, the enemy is the heart itself. Well, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, you might respond, and, and kind of when I read that the first time, it's one of those provocative statements that I think is encouraging of thought, critical thought. Can this be true of the believer? Can it be true of a believer that their heart is still deceitful? Well, John says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? And James, when he says that, that gestation of sin, uh, he sure seems to be referring to believers. Doesn't, then there's nothing in the context to indicate that he's talking to unregenerate people. Paul, uh, this is a controversial passage in Romans 7, when he talks about how the law at work in his members and the law at work in his mind. But he says almost the same thing in Galatians 5, where he says the flesh lusteth against the uh, spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So there does seem to be a, a conflict that we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, that we are to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. But there does seem to be an ongoing conflict within the believer's heart that is the, the primary battleground in which faith is tried, tested, purified. Um, and so I, I think that Mortier has a point here in saying that you know, we, we don't really need to blame the devil. And we don't need, if we are uh, struggling financially, we're not, we're not getting a promotion that we need or we think we need, uh, and we say, well, it's because I'm a Christian. It's because of my faith. Uh, maybe it is. But maybe you're just not a good enough employee to get that promotion. Or, or maybe, you know, you're just not, you just don't happen to be the, the owner's nephew. I mean, that's, okay? What does that have to do with my faith when there's nepotism in the corporation? You know, it's like, it, it all stinks. Yeah. Yeah, right. But they even if the well, let's let's say okay. The answer to that would be monasticism, right? And we all know that monastic orders and monasteries have been nothing but Elysian peace, without conflict, right? And cloisters, for example, we all know that the Amish have always gotten together. Swimmingly, right? No, no. They, you just take your problems with you, right? So, um, if if it were the world, and Paul, I think what James is saying is, the world simply guarantees that there's going to be struggle every day. The fallen world, which includes us, because we're still part of that, even though we are also part of the new creation. Okay, we still have this body of death, this flesh. And we have not yet exchanged it for our incorruptible body, and so um, we are, in a sense, part of that world that is passing away. Our bodies are passing away, right? Inwardly, we're being renewed, but outwardly, we are passing away. That's part of the fall. So we're not, we're not by God's wisdom, we're not separated from the world physically or environmentally. Okay, so and that, and that your point is, is excellent. It really was where I was going. These are James's venue. He doesn't actually deal. He, he doesn't even say so much as, as um, Peter, who says, pray for the king. Or, or Paul, when he says, you know, submit to those who are in authority. He, he makes, as far as I can tell, he makes no allusion to the outside world. Okay, In the context of what he's saying is, within the community or within the person, okay? But the reality is the community
is in the world. Okay? And so, it's not, James is not looking from the world in, but he is looking from in out to the world. And he's going to say in chapter 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Okay? So yeah, the world's out there. And in fact, it does present a way out of our trials and tribulations. And that way out is to compromise or surrender. So the, the world is definitely, I, I don't, I'm just saying these things are not required for us to still have trials, temptations, and need of endurance. Okay? Not to diminish the, the, the power and influence of Satan, although I don't want to exaggerate it either, but also not to diminish the reality of a fallen world and its impact on, on us every day and on the church, and also the church's visual aspect to the world. Are we looking to the world for our um, succor, for our escape, for our way out of trials? And, and I think James is addressing that. that. That's not the right place to look. In fact, if you look there, you are actually, um, he says, adulteresses. He has very harsh words in chapter 4 that, that we'll look at. So, um, the way he is writing this letter is, is very similar to the rabbinic practice of Hakha. And this type of writing is, is like the Mishnah, the Talmud. Um, it, it's not like modern Western post-Reformation commentaries. And if you read modern commentaries, you know, they, it, it's what they call the historical grammatical method of, of hermeneutics. They take the verse, they dissect the verse, they dissect the language, Hebrew or Greek. They give you the tense and the mood and, and you know, all of the conjugations and whatever. And they say, this is what the writer is saying. Okay. Halakha does not do that. Halakha mediates the word through life. And sometimes, as I mentioned last week, you don't necessarily know what verse of the Bible the rabbi is speaking on. Now, once you see the verse, if somebody else says, no, this is, this, you know, this, he's talking about this, you read the verse and you read what he says, oh yeah, I can see where they're connected, but they're not, they're not like we are. We, we're very particular about reciting chapter and verse, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's the way we think. We're not, we're not Jews. We're not ancient uh, Near Eastern people. Um, I'm just saying that James was a Jew and he was writing to Jews and so, just like the Psalms and the Proverbs, you know, he's writing in a particular style, but it's a style that's not so foreign to us that we can't comprehend it. I think that's sometimes there's a, a mistaken attitude that we think, oh, well, that's Eastern logic, and I'm a Westerner, and I can't understand. Well, why is that? Why can't an Easterner understand how a Westerner thinks or vice versa? Are, are we all not descended from Adam? I mean, granted, it takes practice to think in a certain way, just like it takes practice to learn a different language, right? But it's not impossible. Maybe more difficult for some than others, granted. I know it's much more difficult for me to learn a foreign language than most. But we can do it. We're capable of, for example, reading the Proverbs and understanding that they're not to be interpreted as absolute statements. So, for example, we, we love to quote, you know, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we want to view that as a promise, don't we? That God says. It's an infallible, watertight promise that if I do everything right, then my child will be in the kingdom. Is it a promise? 
Because, hmm? well, um, because in the Psalms, which is also wisdom literature, uh, and also in the, well, basically Psalm 49, I think is what I'm thinking of, um, you, you, you're not, you cannot save another. You know, it's, it's not within your power to, to do that. So is Proverbs a promise or is it rather a predisposition that if you raise your child up in the way he should go, it is far more likely that he will not depart from it. If you raise your child the way he should go according to your philosophy, that, that, and you want that to lock in, then you have to accept that the other person will lock in as well. Yes, but I, I'm, I, I grant that. Raising a child in the way you should go according to your philosophy, well, that's, but that, I think we accept that that's not what the passage means. That the way he should go, the key here is, is the way. The idea here in wisdom literature is the idea of two ways. And it's really, it, it's a form of wisdom teaching in the, in the ancient world where you are setting opposites. And you see it in the Proverbs all the way through. You see, for example, wisdom set against folly. Or the, the wise woman and against the adulterous, foolish woman. But so one, one of the two ways is wisdom and folly. And another one is, is going to be rich and poor. The extreme rich and the extreme poor. Another one is light and darkness. But maybe the one that summarizes all of them is life and death. So, for instance, in Deuteronomy, Moses coming to the end of, of his life, he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Joshua, in nearing the end of his life, in Joshua 24, he says, therefore, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The two ways wisdom presents a choice. It presents two options. And oftentimes those options are presented in their ultimate result. Okay? So they're presented as extremes. which does not mean that the extreme will be encountered on the day of the choice, but rather that the choice constitutes a way that, laid, that leads to that end. So the way of the rich, the material rich, is a way of destruction. But the psalmist in Psalm 73 is lamenting the fact that he doesn't see it. He sees the wealthy prospering in all their ways. No pain in their lives. In fact, he sees the, he sees the righteous suffering. And he, he doesn't understand. And then he says, I went into the house of the Lord. And I perceived their end. Okay? So, oftentimes what we're reading in Proverbs, in the Psalms, in James, in the parables, we're reading... This kind of wisdom 
and we're reading it presented in opposites, extremes. And it almost seems like it's just too uh, black and white. You know, that the fact is that we know that many, many wealthy people do not suffer in this world. That their, wealth, their riches do not um, cause them any distress whatsoever. That they are happy in their wealth. That's what the psalmist in Psalm 73 is basically saying. You know, that, that what he, he had come to believe was that those who, and it's not riches for riches' sake. I want to make sure, because we're, we're going to get into that here. It's riches as opposed to God. The two ways that Jesus presents are you cannot serve God and mammon. These are two paths that do not converge and they do not run parallel. They run 180 degrees from each other. And that's the idea of the two ways. And maybe we could say that the extreme language that's used is intended to impress the importance of the path on which you trod. Not intended to show you the immediate result of your choice, but the ultimate result. And it's wisdom that sees that ultimate result. Even when the immediate steps, they look fine. Doesn't seem like anything's going wrong here. Okay? Everything's fine. I've, I've got, I've got all, the, all that I need. In fact, I'll just go ahead and, and I'll build bigger barns because of the bumper crop that I had this year. And what happens? You fool. Tonight, what you didn't see when you started walking down this path was that there would be a night on which your life would be required of you. And then it's settled. So, um, just again, somewhat background, somewhat hermeneutics. Um, how do we look at James? Uh, I think that James is, is very much employing this two-way tradition of wisdom literature. And again, I don't think he's doing it self-consciously. This was the kind of wisdom that he grew up in. This is the wisdom of Proverbs. This is also the wisdom of Ben Sirach. This is the wisdom of the apocryphal literature that we, that we do have extant. But there was also probably many other books that the Jews read in their homes, in their synagogues, that we don't have. This was a way of presenting the way he should go. So when you raise up your child in the way he should go, that is, that is, you need to encourage him to walk on the path that leads to light and life and to avoid the path that leads to darkness and death. Okay. Any comments? Well, let me um, quote uh, another commentary, or com uh, author. Um, let's see if I can find it. James builds his letter around the polar opposites of two lifestyles. One led in friendship with God, the other in friendship with the world. And this antagonism can be taken as thematic for the composition of James's letter as a whole. And, and I, I agree with that statement. I, I, don't, I don't think that we can boil down James's letter into any one principle. I don't, I'm not saying that. But he does seem to go back and forth between two lifestyles. Even at the very beginning when he says that the man who doubts is the two-souled man. Okay? Um, he's he's uh, Mr. Facing Both Ways, okay? as Bunyan would put it. So um, if, we, if we think about that dichotomy that is inherent in this type of literature, uh, hopefully we'll be able to sort out and interpret the particular things that James writes and not get, not get hung up um, necessarily when he uses language like wars and fighting and murder as he does in chapter 4. Okay. Are, are these things that are actually going on? 
inside the community of the diaspora? Are they actually killing each other? Well, if they are, it seems rather incongruous that he would say some of the other things that he does. You know, like if any among you are sick, call for the elders. What about the dead? Um, you know, I, I think if we understand the type of literature, we realize that it, it is often, it's kind of like, analogously, it's like the apocalyptic literature. The language is very vivid and graphic. It's, it's stunningly so and sometimes troublingly so. But that's that type of literature. And we understand that the use of, of extreme positions, the use of um, seemingly immediate results that then don't actually happen. It's the unbeliever that says, as Peter, the scoffer says, everything goes on as it has from the beginning. Okay? It's the fool who says that. In, in, in Psalms, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. He doesn't see me do what I'm doing. But it's the wise man who says, well, yeah, you're getting away with it now. But when I went into the house of the Lord, I perceived your end. You know, that, that's the two ways. It sets it out. It's almost like it telescopes the result of a choice right up to the moment of that choice. When in reality, the day after the person makes that choice, there, there's no immediate consequence, right? You just keep on going and there's no immediate consequence. In fact, after a while there doesn't seem to be any consequence at all. And the fool becomes hardened in his folly because he thinks God doesn't notice. Okay? And that's really why this language has to be so extreme. Is you have to understand that as Paul says in Galatians, if you bite and devour one another, Take care lest you consume one another. There'd be nothing left. That's where it leads. That's where much of what James is saying, and, and I think sometimes the difficulty in understanding James is that he does speak in such uh, vivid and harsh language that we, you know, we don't like hearing it. In the passage that we're looking at this evening, and, and actually, it's a somewhat lengthy passage. I don't think we'll be able to get through all of it. But I want to talk about several passages in James chapter 1. Uh, starting with... Now, now, I believe there's some overlap. And, and actually, in the notes, we start with verse 5 of chapter 1. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But we've already dealt with that in a previous lesson, though I deal with it a little bit more in this one. I want to start with um, verse 9. Through 11. Because James introduces in this passage another theme that is going to be woven through the rest of the book. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. And let the rich man glory in his humility or his humil humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off. And the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. See, this is a man who is pursuing riches. Pursuing wealth. This is the man who later on says, tomorrow we'll go here and we'll go there and we'll trade and we'll make money. This is the same man. Only that passage is portraying his pursuit and that he's still in and shows that um, you do not, he says, you fool. You do not know that you have tomorrow. Rather, you should say, if the Lord wills. And he's not, obviously, I think we understand. He's not suggesting that we should use that phrase as some type of talisman you know, it doesn't make our heart right with God to say, Lord willing. Hey. There, there's a sense in which there's a leveling going on here. Um, actually, the passage is a little bit difficult. 
It's, it's hard to tell whether verse 10 isn't ironic. It, it's actually very hard to tell whether the rich and the poor here are both treated as believers by James. When he speaks to the poor, and he says, and we're going we're to look at that, what, what does he mean when he says, let the poor exalt in his high position? Well, that's, that seems fairly straightforward in terms of what Jesus, for example, says about storing up treasure in heaven. Um, it, it's hard to go into the depth of it in a lecture, but I think you know from the Old Testament that socioeconomic position was a major factor in what the prophets had to say. It's also a major factor of the holiness code in Leviticus. It's a major factor, for example, in the life of the only man that I read of in the Old Testament about which nothing negative is said, Boaz, is a man who seems to live in practice the holiness code. He does not allow his workers to glean over his harvest twice, but it's to be left for the poor. Okay, he's, he's, a, he's a righteous man. So rich and poor set themselves up in the paradigm of Israel. Riches and poverty, they set themselves up as, if not two paths, the, not the intersection, but the starting point of two divergent paths. So when he says... Let the man of humble circumstances exalt in his glory, in his high position. Well, where is that high position? It's, it's not now. The poor is oppressed. The poor is despised. Even in chapter 2, the poor is made to sit on the floor rather than in a seat, a chair. This is an example of what is that high position? Well, the high position is, as Paul would put it, I guess, you're seated in Christ at the right hand of God Almighty. As he says in Ephesians, that you have received all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. It's not my circumstances. James is not saying that that there's some sanctity and glory in poverty. That's how it's been misunderstood. That somehow being poor itself is, it's, it's itself sanctifying. No, it's just as great a temptation in one direction as riches are in another, which is why the writer of Proverbs 30 says, Lord, give me neither great riches nor poverty. Just that. Exactly. A, a poor person can be just as covetous, and perhaps even more so. But that's exactly what the proverb, the writer of that proverb, King, I think it's Egor, I'm not positive. Um, but that's basically what he's saying there is, lest I be so rich that I forget about you, or lest I be so poor that I steal and profane your name. You know, he doesn't exalt, and, and that's a key here. You, you're, not, you're not exalting poverty as if you should take vows of poverty, and that somehow is your path to glory. That's what happened to verses like this. That's not what James is saying. Remember, James is the chief rabbi of the church of Jerusalem, in which there are very wealthy people. Joseph of Arimathea, Barnabas was part of that church, right? And these people were very generous with their wealth. They were not relying on their wealth. He is not condemning wealth for wealth's sake, nor is he exalting poverty for poverty's sake. He's saying, if your circumstances in this world are of poverty, exalt in your high position. Okay? Not, not in your current position, but again, the two ways tradition of, you know, look to where you're headed and where you are in Christ and realize you are, you are already highly exalted, even though you're not. Can you use that same thought process with James? 
Yes, you can. You can use that in verse 10. Let the rich, and this is absolutely true, let the rich man glory rather in his humiliation. Glory in the fact that he is but dust, and that, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, you know, who will have all that you've la labored for once you're gone? Okay. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was an excellent essay, or maybe just an article, about the incredible permanence of the world when contrasted with the incredible transience of a human life. I mean, and, and I think about that sometimes. We have the opportunity through our company and whatnot to, to actually build our house. And we love it. But that house will be there, hopefully, <laughs> long after I'm gone, right? And I've lived in homes that had been lived in by other people. We're just passing through. We're just passing through. Everything we have will be someone else's someday. Or it'll just be in the dirt. I mean, it's, it's a perspective that, that the rich should have. And that is, you are but dust. That's what he says. Like the, like the flower of the field when the Shirako wind blows in, it just wilts and dries up. And that's what we'll, you will be. So verse 10 is, is in itself very profound, proverbial. Any believer with money, with wealth, should read it. And say, don't, don't put your hope or your trust or your security in your wealth. Rather understand that, well, God, by God's providence, you have wealth. But you too will die. Um, and this is something that, that the ancient philosophers understood. Um, I'm not sure I can find the quote in the notes as to... Um, yeah, I'm not going to find it very readily. But it, it's, it's from a Greek philosopher. It basically says the same thing. And it, 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 you, know how we say, you know how we say, well, he puts his pants on one leg at a time. You know, he's nothing special about him until he can jump into his pants, both legs, and I don't want to try that. Uh, but what, what this particular philosopher says is, let him, be, let him be reminded that he puts his mortal legs into his pants one at a time. But it, the, the emphasis is on the mortal, that we're all mortal. So, yeah, it could be taken that way. The problem is, it would be the only place in the entire book where James speaks of the rich as if they are believers. Now, that doesn't mean he's not. And it may be in this early chapter, he's treating the rich more ambivalently than he will later on. But even one, not even one chapter later, in chapter 2, um, well, first of all, when he says in verse 11, the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. He does a very Jesus-like switch in his metaphor. The beauty and the appearance of the flower correspond to the wealth of the rich man, right? But what is it that withers and fades away. The rich man. Look at the last clause. Not his wealth. In fact, his wealth may survive him. Most likely will. It'll be his heirs that'll waste it <laughs> and squander it. That's, that's so common in history. But it, it's, it's, he, he talks about, okay, it's like the flowers of the field. But no, I'm not talking about the splendor of his wealth. I'm talking about him. And he will fade away. That, that's not a... That's not a good thing to say about someone, that you're going to just fade away. But later on, in chapter 2, speaking of the wealthy, he says, in verse 7, Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Later on, in verse um, chapter 5, 
He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. He goes on. <laughs> so, again, it's possible. This is some of the difficulty in James in, in sorting out exactly what was, your, what was your opinion of the wealthy person in, in chapter 1? You don't have to ask James what his opinion of, uh, is of the wealthy person in chapter 5. He's making it quite clear. And, and even in chapter 2, when he says, Are these not the men that blaspheme the fair name by which you are called? That's not a believer. Okay, that's not, that's not a true believer. And yet they're in the assembly... And they're being, they're being accorded honor because of their wealth. So again, the problem is not the wealth itself. The problem is, or the poverty, the problem is how one or the other impacts our relationship with God. How it impacts the path we choose to walk on. Because as Josiah mentioned, and, and as the writer of Proverbs mentions, being poor does not automatically and inherently put you on the path of righteousness. Not at all. Nor does being rich put you inherently and inevitably on the path of destruction. That's not true either. So you, you can't boil these things down into um, uh, trite and infallible statements that say, Poverty is next to godliness, or wealth is destructive. Okay. Um, so they're, they're careful in how they couch the words, but the struggle we have in reading James, as I mentioned last week, the struggle is trying to determine um, who, who are you talking about? Are you talking about believers here? Or are you talking about two different types of people within the professing community. So uh, one commentator says, <clears throat> and this is accurate, he says, in this case the wealthy Christian is instructed to take no pride in possessions, but rather to think on his self-abasement in identifying with Christ and Christ's poor people. This is how most scholars have interpreted the phrase. And it is a truism. There's nothing wrong with saying that the wealthy person, the wealthy believer, should meditate on the transient nature of life and of wealth. Should meditate on how he has joined himself to one who became poor that we might become rich. Who impoverished himself of the glory of divinity, as it were. Philippian, or, um, yeah, Philippians chapter 2. He laid down his glory and took up the humility of a human being. And even that, he did not come as an exalted king or aristocrat, but rather a humble carpenter's son. So, yeah, the, the, wealthy, is the, per the wealthy person is the one who should be. I mean, it's very odd to think of a poor person meditating on his self-abasement. That's, that's not what James is saying. The poor person is already abased in the sense of, of, of the life around him. He, he rather needs to remind himself of the treasures that are stored up for him in heaven. He needs to, for example, read the, the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man and be encouraged to faithfulness in his poverty, knowing that it will be rewarded infinitely beyond anything he could ask or hope. The wealthy person, on the other hand, needs to consider his mortality, needs to consider that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment, needs to understand that his wealth is fleeting, and to whom much is given, much is required. You know, there's, there's a whole... Does that make sense? I mean, we, we tend to think that everything applies to everybody, but in fact, with, especially with wisdom literature... You, you have to seek wisdom to understand, okay, is this, this speaking to me? Well, let me check my checkbook. Yeah, it's speaking to me. And I mean one way or the other. 
You know, is that I, I have much. I'm in this category. I have very little. In fact, it's negative. Uh oh. You know, I am in that category. And, and it becomes a, a path that both the rich and the poor can be on either of the two ways. He's not, and I, I want to make that crystal clear, he's not saying that the two ways are riches and poverty. No. But that the rich and the poor both have to choose the right way. And it will not necessarily, the poor will not, as the prosperity gospel teaches, the poor will not become rich by making the right choice. Okay? And, that the, and the rich are not required to give away all their wealth and take a vow of poverty when they make the right choice. That's not the point. Okay? The point is, where is your faith? We have to remind ourselves that this entire letter is really about the perfecting of our faith through trials. Poverty and riches, then, are trials. They are examples of trials that every believer encounters in this life. It just so happens that the power of this world is vested in the wealthy. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so if you look at the rich and the poor and what Paul or James has to say about them, that's not an inherent problem. If you look at what God promised for his people, he promised and intended prosperity. Okay, that they would not lack for anything. But the, the issue that, that we face, and we face it in every age, including our own, is that the power belongs to the wealthy. You, you've all heard the golden rule. You know, he who has the gold makes the rules. Okay? What can we do about that? Oh, we, our government needs to take away the money from the rich and give it to the poor so that we can all be corrupt. I mean, it's like there's no way of changing that. It's just, it's the world in which we live. It's the symptom of the age that is passing away. So that there is an inherent disadvantage that the poor man has that the rich man doesn't. And I think it's because of that inherent disadvantage that God always shows himself intently active on behalf of the poor, of the oppressed, of the alien, of the widow, of the orphan. Okay? And James is the same way. What do the rich need? It's like, you know, what do the healthy need a physician? No. Do the wealthy need care and comfort and succor? No. They have enough for themselves and deny any for the poor. That's the way of the world. That was the way of Israel. That was the message of the prophets. That the, that the, uh, they were, the, the, the pastors, the priests, were fleecing the flock instead of shepherding it. Okay. So we're, we're not leveling anything here. We're recognizing that, that the world is divided between the wealthy few and the poor many, and that power does and ho has always resided in the hands of those who have money, that, or at least they are allied with those who are in power. They are funding and bankrolling those who are in power. And the reality is the poor have no recourse but God. And, and so when, when James talks about when a brother and sister comes in need of food or clothing, he's simply just speaking again, almost like an Old Testament prophet. These, you know, what is true or pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, sight of our God and Father? to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Okay, that's, you know, jumping ahead to the end of our, of our section, but that's where he's headed. What does this thing, what does orthopraxy look like? Well, it is compassionate. It is um, helpful. And it... It helps primarily those who are helpless. 
So he's going to flow right into chapter 2, where he castigates them for favoritism, for a wicked judgment. And even the disciples, Judaism also had its prosperity gospel. Do you remember what the disciples said when Jesus said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved? What did the disciples say? Who then can be saved? Because they had been brought up with the idea that if you obeyed the commandments of God, God would prosper you. Therefore, if that man is prospering, he must obey the commandments. They were like Job's friends. They would make false cause and effect conclusions and they came to the mindset that, well, if the wealthy can't be saved, who can? Okay? It is so endemic in our minds to make these types of cause and effect linkages. God has given wealth. We, we see this, oh, where is that in Leviticus? You, you talked about it in Sunday school one time. Um, you will have no poor among you. If there are poor among you, you shall always have poor among you. Le Leviticus 17, okay? It's like, and Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. All right. I'm not going to try to explain that. I think there's many different aspects of, of God's wisdom that he reveals in his word about that. But certainly, uh, one aspect of, of the poor and the presence of the poor is as objects of compassion and benevolence for the rich. Objects of employees for the rich. Boaz, you know, object, objects of, of God's compassion mediated through the righteous rich. And that's really where James is coming from. He's not condemning riches in and of themselves. He's not praising poverty in and of itself. But he's saying these are these are aspects of the world in which we live. They are aspects of the trials that we go through. And sometimes people go through both. Paul says, I have learned to abound and to be abased. I imagine there were, there were times when, when Paul's uh, tent-making trade was, was booming or his churches were very generous in their contributions and he was abounding. And we certainly know that there were times when the kitty was empty and, and he was abased. But he learned contentment. In verse 9, in the ESV, it says lowly. It doesn't say he used the word poor. What is that? Is this translation? Well, actually, lowly, um, mine says, let the brother of humble circumstances. Uh, yes, this is something that the commentators talk about when they look at the word and they, how is it used in the rest of Scripture and all of that. Um, it, in the contrast... It can be used of, of different things, but it is contrast with the rich man. Okay? The, 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 the word rich man is, is actually not word rich man. It's the, the one who has much. Okay, that's the one who has much. And then he goes on to describe how that can all pass away. So we translate the word lowly as it is contrasted with the rich. And that's why we come up with it being, this is the poor. Because I was thinking that the, the, the humiliation of the rich could be in his humbleness. Because he understands what riches mean. That's what it should be. But I'm not sure that James isn't being somewhat ironic here, only because of the way he treats the rich everywhere else. If we treat him in verse 10 as being favorable to the rich, and he may be, and maybe he's starting out giving them the benefit of the doubt. All right, because he's not condemning wealth in and of itself. I, I don't believe that he is. But, and there, there would be no struggle with that of treating both of these groups as believers if it weren't for what Paul then says in the next chapter, in chapter 5, about the rich. Okay, that, it's really the context, the immediate context does not tell us definitively whether the man in, chapter, in verse 10 is a believer or not a believer. And, and I think it's fine to treat it as, because what it says is true for any wealthy believer. But there's also a possibility that the way it's phrased is somewhat ironic, somewhat um, scathing. Uh, let, let him glory in his humiliation. 
Let him glory. He's not glorying in his humiliation. We find out later he's actually glorying in his power. He's taking the poor to court. He's not paying their wages. That's what he's glorying in. And then he goes on to describe what that humiliation is, and that is, as the Shirako wind comes in, so will your life be. Okay? It's, it's not a pretty picture that he then paints in verse 11. So it, it's indeterminate whether he's... What he has to say, the content of what he says in verse 10 is accurate and applicable to any believer with wealth. Absolutely. But in this particular setting, he may be gently, he doesn't do much gently, uh, he may be leading in to much harsher language concerning the poor very soon. Okay? That, that I can't be dogmatic about. Anyhow, closing this, this evening's uh, time, we need to look at, uh, we can't look at it in the, in the deal, in the depth that it deserves, but starting in verse 17, it, it, 17 through 27 is really um, describing the way a man or a woman walks who has chosen the right path. When he says, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, that verse 17 counters verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God gave me this trial. God is tempting me. No, God gives only good and perfect gifts. That's his, that's his response. There's the negative. Don't say that this came from God because what comes from God is good, is perfect. And that's the only thing that comes from God. He says in verse um, 18, in, in the exercise of his will, which is the motivation of his gift and the only motivation of his gift, is His will. He brought us forth by the word of truth. Well, that is directly countering verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Those are the same words in verse 15 and verse 18. We, in our corruption and our lust, bring forth sin and death. God, in His graciousness, brings forth new life. That we might be, as He says, the first fruits among His creatures. So, we talked about the gestation of sin and how within us, within our heart, without any assistance from the outside world or the devil, we can conceive and give birth to sin and death. That's what we create. God, on the other hand, whose every gift is perfect and is no shadow of changing with Him, He brings forth eternal life. Same word. So, Paul or James is saying, all right, when you look at yourself, look at these verses. This is what you are. Now look at these verses. This is what God is. So, there's not a whole lot of free will in this passage. There's not a whole lot of spark of divine goodness in man. There's not a whole lot of pick, your up, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and give it a good college try. You know, none of that. If you look at yourself, you are the creator of sin and death. Look at God. He is the gracious creator of life. Physical life at the beginning, but then Paul says that he who, who spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light, has spoken into our hearts to bring the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what God does. So, knowing that, and we have to, we have to highlight the grace portions of James. Number one, because they've been so often mis misread and misapplied and totally missed. But number two, because 
they are the foundation for what he then says about good works. They're not the result of our good works. No, our good works are up in chapter, at verses 13 through 15. That's what we do. We're little sin factories, is what we are. Is, is that not a fair statement? Did anybody object to that? It's like, and I don't mean to be maudlin or anything, but I think what he says is the, the whole wickedness of the descent into sin cannot even be blamed on the temptation. It can only be blamed on the lust within our hearts. That's what we produce. So the idea that, that the fallen heart of man could possibly produce faith is impossible. That must come because it's a good thing. And that must come then from God. So we're, we're presented here with ourselves. There's the anthropology. And then we're presented with God. There's the soteriology. And now we're presented with, now this is how you live. And he says, starting in um, verse 19... Uh, and we're going to hit this one again because when he says, This you know, my brethren, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's a tongue thread weaving in. Okay, remember we talked about how the tongue is one of those patterns that are woven into the fabric of this book. And so it's, it's, we're not going to be able to just hermetically separate the different themes because they're going to, oh, there's a, there's a tongue thread that just ran through. We're going to look at that more closely in that theme. But he goes on, a very familiar voice, a verse, passage. He says, um, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, I think the King James has a, a very quaint a superfluity of naughtiness that should, should be in every uh, preschool classroom. Um, Superfluity of naughtiness, but that's, that's not how we have it in our modern English. Um, he says, uh, putting this all aside in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Here, here again, orthopraxy. Okay? He's not denying orthodoxy. But he's saying, prove yourself doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay? And he goes on to say, and this is a passage that, again, it's very homely. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Um, there's a lot of comment about what he means by this analogy. And a lot of talking about the kind of mirror, especially among Puritan writers, they like to talk about how the Word of God is the perfect mirror. Okay. That is true if we see clearly in it, which we often don't because of our, the corruption within our minds. But I don't think that's what James is saying here. In fact, I'm not, I don't think he's saying anything negative about the man in the mirror. He's simply saying that this is what happens. And I don't know if it's true of women, but I think it's more true of men that they look at themselves in the mirror in the morning when they're getting ready for work or whatever, and then they go about the rest of the day oblivious to what they look like. It doesn't make any lasting change is the point. Looking at yourself in the mirror doesn't change who you are, right? You just go on about your day, and finally about 4.30 in the afternoon, one of your coworkers tells you that you cut yourself shaving and you have a streak of blood down your, you know, oh, thanks, okay? Um, you, you don't really give thought then. And in fact, we have a word for people who spend their lives in the mirror. They're called narcissists, right? And it's affliction. It's not a, it's not, it's not a compliment. Most of us look in the mirror, do what we need to do, brush our teeth, comb our hair, and then we go away. Okay? 
He says, forget what's, what type of man he is. And what he means there is he just, he doesn't dwell on it. it it's, it's made no impact. Does that make sense? And, and that's what it is for a man who reads the word, but doesn't do it. It makes no impact. Okay, that's what he's driving at here, because that's where he's headed, is what does this word implanted in your soul that is able to save your soul, what is it that it, that it impacts? But when one looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. You see, this will have an impact. Okay. My day at work will not go one way or the other on account of the five minutes I stand in front of the mirror in the morning. But my life will have a tremendous impact, and the Word will have a tremendous impact if I dwell intently on the Word so as to do it, not just to hear it. And I want to make sure that we understand that this is not the social gospel, and this is not the... the pervasive and chronic teaching within Christian history that it's more important what you do than what you believe. That is not what he's saying here. It is the perfect law of liberty, the Word of God implanted in our hearts that we dwell on. Okay, We don't just simply close our Bibles and go do what we want and what we think is good. It's not the orthopraxy, it's orthodoxy with orthopraxy. So he's not advocating, you know, stop, stop spending so much time studying your Bible. Get out there and do something. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is endeavor to do what you read there. And that's what he's then going to go on into. So he says in verse 26, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, there's that thread again, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. It's empty. The word religion is a um, slippery word. Because what it means today is not what it meant in the first century. Either in the Latin or the Greek or the Hebrew. Um, today, religion is a set of doctrinal statements that you adhere to. What, what is your religion? Oh, I'm Presbyterian, or I'm Catholic, or I'm Buddhist. You see, religion is not even limited to, um, to Christianity or professing Christianity. Religion is more uh, an organized system of thought, right? Does that make sense? In James's world, religion was the out outward manifestation of what you did in worship. It was a term used for, for example, the priests when they brought sacrifice, not only in Jerusalem, but also in Rome and in Athens and in Corinth. Okay? It, was, it was a word of, of practice, of doing, not a word of, of doctrinal statement. In fact, many of the religions of that world had no doctrinal statements. They only had religio which is like the Greek word latreia, what you do in worship. So again, James is not talking about religion. You know, if you say you're religious, if you say you're... In fact, this is the only place in the New Testament where the word is used as an, as an adjective. You say you're religious. That's not, apparently not anywhere else. Um, but he's not saying if you, if you say you're a Christian, that's wrapped up in it. But what he's really doing is he's just continuing the thought. If you say that you're living out your faith, but you don't bridle your tongue, well, you don't compassionately help your brother and sister when you have the means to do so. See, he's going he's to go on with this. You don't love your brother, but you, you slander him. You don't treat the poor man and the rich man the same. You know, he's going to now give... 
bunch of examples of what he means by the man who says he's religious, but he doesn't do these things. Well, his religion is worthless. Just like he's going to say a little bit later, your faith is dead. Okay? And if your faith is dead, so is your religio. Okay? So is your, your walk, your action. Okay? So that's what he means in verse 26. Finally, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It is, it has, this verse has been taken, um, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with the history of it in, in the 20th century, uh, particularly with uh, liberation theology. Um, it has been taken to mean that the sum total of Christianity is benevolence, is to help the poor, the starving, it's to go to Africa and help them dig wells for fresh water, help them plant crops, help feed people. Their physical needs, that is the essence of true, pure, and undefiled religion. Um, most scholarly commentators throughout the ages have concluded that that is not what James is getting at here. He's not saying that this is the sum total, this in, the entirety of pure and undefiled religion. He's simply saying that if you don't have this, compassion for the helpless, then your religion is impure and defiled. So we're not looking at it necessarily from the sense that if we do these things, then we are pure and undefiled. That by doing these things, we render ourselves pure and undefiled. Because what he's going to immediately go into, in chapter 2 especially, is that if we don't do things, we prove our religion to be impure and defiled. And what is it that, that defiles ourself? Because he says, pure and undefiled religion is in the beginning. And then he says, at the end, to keep oneself unstained by the world. Well, defiled and stained are ritual synonyms. It, it, it implies a taint upon the offering, a blemish, something that renders it no longer worthy of presenting to God. When something is defiled, it either needs to be cleansed, right, or destroyed. And there were prescriptions in the Levitical law as to the item itself, whether or not it could be cleansed. If it was cleansed, this is how you would do it. If it could not be cleansed, what was left? It was destroyed. So um, he's, I think he's using Levitical language. He's using Jewish heritage, the language of their heritage, when he says, okay, to keep the pure and undefiled religion, what is it then that tends to defile us and stain us. Well, it is that. And that's going to become, um, again, a major theme. But we see it here, as we're going to see it, and I'll go ahead and jump ahead to chapter 4, where he says in verse 4, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There is, there are the two paths. Friendship with God, friendship with the world. Friendship with God will keep you from being stained by the world. It will keep your religion, your practice of the word, purer and less defiled. I don't, I don't want to uh, presume, as Paul said, I have not yet attained perfection. But if each step we take on the path toward the world is a path of defilement, rendering our offering to God 
more and more offensive. Let's close in prayer. Father, we do pray that you would help us by your Spirit to understand these often difficult words that we read in the book of James. Help us to not only understand them, but as, even as we read them, that we would do them, that we would strive in our hearts to receive the Word, humbly receive the Word implanted, knowing that it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace to your glory. And that is what we do seek. So we ask your help, your guidance, your spirit. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.